It costs them almost no energy to turn that little laser on. But the Casimir force has a big effect on the whole cavity, pushing electrons. And that's exactly how he designed it. It's a tiny thing, as you can see, 50 to 100 is a method device, you know, a method. Uh, and it's working on the micron scale. And of course, you can gang these up so you can get kilowatts and megawatts just by reproducing them. Much like we do right now in flat screen TV. You've got a whole bunch of diodes in an array, and you're looking at the cumulative effect of all of them. Well, I decided to do this uh, when the after getting fired from the patent office, I, I decided to finish my PhD. And, I, and interesting enough, this is a good crowd to tell the story, in 1999, I tried to have my first conference on free energy of the state department. You think I got in trouble for doing that? It worked real good for about a year until the only physicist in the state department says, well, we've got to have a peer review of your paper. And I had 14 uh, two-day conference, 14 speakers all lined up. And of course, he didn't want to do peer review, he just wanted to keep me out of the state department. And the American Physical Society, in which I stopped my membership then, decided to attack me in weekly columns. And it was called What's New, Robert Park. And of course, it had all these people read the Robert Park columns, and it's like, oh, we got involved in the topic. Well, as I inquired on moving out of there, the DOE, DOE said, no, we don't want you to be too controversial now. Uh, the place I worked, the Department of Commerce, also became a hot trouble when I even investigated using the auditorium there. So suffice it to say, I turned a bad thing into a good result and, and did actually investigate zero point energy for a feasibility study in the PhD. And, uh, and then I got reinstated six years later, which I'm happy to say I think that was okay. And recently now, since that was a very technical book, I decided to do a very um, watered down layman's book, lots of pictures, and also lots of easy explanations and almost no, no equations at all. And that's zero point energy fuel future, uh, which is available also at the end of the book. And so the interesting thing is you see this in the New York Times, you see it in lots of different magazines, and many UFO uh, articles always point to the fact that yeah, this, these saucers that fly interstellar must be using zero point energy for their telescopes. Uh, and, and this is something that we sort of take for granted, but we don't understand how this would be possible. And so I think there's great hope in the future, and especially now as we get to the last topic, propulsion, I think you'll see that there are a lot of uh, ideas here that are worth pursuing. Now, first of all, when you hear on the Science Channel and other programs about the SETI program and various other scientists that are doing what they call planet hunting, uh, have you ever heard these PhDs say, oh, well, we don't really know where to look, which stars to target to see if there's planets around them? Well, did they ever think of looking at the Betty and Barney Hill story? On the star map? Nope, they not. And interestingly enough, as you look at the Zeta Reticuli incident, we have a few reprints in the astronomy magazine. This star map is the most fascinating star map made, even by astronomers of our local neighborhood, up to 50 light years from Earth. And 50 light years is not that far when you consider 100,000 light years is the size of our galaxy. Right. 50 light years is really the, the range in which we're exposed to. And it took years later for Marjorie Fish to put together a 3D beaten string replication of the star map. And, and I have to correct that, because she did a 50 uh, light year local neighborhood uh, mapping of all the stars, and then started to look for the star map to see if there's any correlation. And as it turned out, this star map verified that all the stars in this drawing are solar mass size. The size of our sun, which is very unusual. Well, our sun is, is, uh, is in a minority, if you look in the galaxy. They're usually giants, they're usually binaries, there's all kinds of stuff you can learn in astronomy that are really exemptions to finding a place like ours. And so solar mass size is small, compact, and within a short distance we have this critical zone where the Earth is that supports life. And that's what the astronomers know, but they don't know how to find these stars. Well, all these stars are solar mass size, and they're the only ones in the 50 light year distance. So you have to give Betty Hill a good deal of credit 
And of course, she didn't even know that she had recorded this in her mind until she was hypnotized, which adds a lot of authenticity to it as well. So that's the kind of technicalities that I look for. Even Wendell Stevens, for example, you probably know Wendell Stevens and all the books he's written. Well, he's done audio recordings, he's done technical analysis, spectral analysis. That's how you finally get down to how the machines are working on the ship. And many of them, of course, with the rotary, probably are rotary turning uh, spinning things. But to me, this is a very valuable piece of evidence. And I look forward to actually sending this, and I have sent this to astronomers to at least invite them to kind of get interdisciplinary. There's no reason they have to stay in their telescope thinking that they have to guess at where it's pointing. Uh, they can actually take some uh, suggestions from the other, the other side. And of course, when we talk about propulsion, there's lots of historical land gravity research. And this is the interesting thing as well, that in the physics journals, such as 1962, we see specific ways to create uh, empty or opposing upward gravitational fields. And to me, this is very interesting. Many of them, of course, require a lot of energy, and that can also be a little bit uh, prohibitive. <coughs> but I luckily was involved in uh, helping Nick Cook when he wrote the Hunter Zero Point and the uh, attempt to identify and describe the classified uh, world of any gravity technology. And he visited lots of places and people, and for example, the president of Lockheed, and, and he did a video tape as well about this afterwards. You know, if you saw the Billion Dollar Secret, the two-hour special uh, on the Discovery Channel. And of course, he's sitting in front of the, the president of Lockheed, and he's asking him, well, what are white projects? Oh, white projects are things that we can work on and talk about and describe to them. And, uh, and then there was some other projects as well. He said, what are black projects? And he said, well, black projects are the kind that we cannot talk about. And then he shut up. You know, and Nick Cook asked another question about black projects. He didn't go answer. So um, that's about as far as you get with the, uh, the direct route. But the indirect route is a good way to do it as well. And it accumulate the evidence, spend years, recording anecdotes like Paul Hill did, and then get somebody like uh, Robert Wood to put together his book and get it published years later after he passed away, and then we have an historic record of the <coughs> behavior of UFOs and the fact that they obeyed physics laws. The inertia, um, the, for example, the right hand turns. I'm fascinated by the fact that UFOs do right hand turns. Even some classified uh, projects apparently do it as well. Uh, craft. And, and what I call them are inertia free terms. And you'll see why in a second. But the interesting thing is, Paul Hill does a great analysis. If you have the ability to create the force, like a 10G reversal, um, you basically can see it happening in less than a second. So, so a person sitting on Earth looking at this UFO will make a very quick turn, you might think that it's violating the laws of physics. But Paul Hill proves in this book, and I highly recommend it for people investigating any science behind UFOs, uh, to find that you can actually explain, as he does, comparing by airplane acceleration and saucer acceleration, the same principle of apply. And the banking effect on this diagram here is true. Saucers will bank when they turn, just like airplanes, because the force is being projected out of the bottom. So this is the future. For example, here's a good video to show you what I'm talking about. So watch this house They're very closely as we can. type of acceleration is really something that uh, I think is our future too, because the field propulsion also involves the separation of the, what's causing the inertia, and I'll explain that in a second. So here's some examples of UFOs that at least had some scientific explanations behind them that the physicists could actually look at and then try to make some sense of. Uh, the electrokinetics of Townsend Brown, uh, John Searle's electrophysics, and of course, the secondary gravitational effects, like the Lazar saucer. Um, 
he's giving a couple of lectures that are on videotape explaining how the nuclear strong force can actually be connected to gravity. And it does make sense. There is some physics there that's worth pursuing. 